Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the new February 2023 uh, BFRB Club webinar. Uh, this month, we're continuing where we actually began this series of webinars, which is with step two. Uh, in the first webinar in this particular series, the step one webinar, we talked about um, habit reversal training as the first step uh, in your healing journey. And today we're moving on to talk about the second step. Uh, the first step was very much practical and down to earth. The second step uh, is also very practical, but it will involve a little bit, a bit of philosophizing because at this point it is necessary to introduce a different perspective on change. Whereas in step one, uh, we were talking about becoming more aware of your patterns, of what triggers you, of thoughts and emotions that precede or happen after you pick or pull. We talked about finding replacement habits, so-called stimulus control. We talked about, sorry, competing responses, but we also talked about stimulus control. Um, and then in step two, uh, we will be taking a slightly uh, different route. Uh, you will see why this is important. We'll be talking about patience, discipline, and self-compassion. Um, and then uh, next time, when we do the step three, we will talk about another very big topic, one that is practical more than anything else, uh, which is about how to relate differently to your emotional experiences. Um, and then step four is that final deep dive into um, kind of taking a plunge into, into our unconscious minds and resolving some of the issues that may be located there. Um, so here, before uh, before I go on and digress forever and ever, uh, let's see what exactly we'll be talking about today. Uh, first, we will talk about goals for step two, right? So um, in step one, we knew exactly what the goals were. The goals were uh, to find replacement habits and then implement them so that you reduce your picking or pulling, right, to minimize damage and to get some more control over your BFRB. We'll talk a little bit about what we hope to achieve with step two. Uh, then we'll talk about specific, um, we'll talk about specific um, um, skills, let's say, that you develop through step two, which is what is discipline, how discipline relates to willpower. We'll talk about patience. We'll talk about values and intentions, and then we'll talk about how to cultivate uh, discipline and patience, and then an honorable mention to self-compassion. And I can do the honorable mention right now, uh, since in the meantime, since step one, I have uploaded a short three-week course called Self-Compassion 101. So you can do the, the course for free and get several hours of video materials, workbooks, notes, guided meditations, the whole thing for free. So just log into the club. You'll see a link uh, in the members section, which is why I will not talk too much about self-compassion in this webinar. Um, I will focus more on developing discipline uh, and patience and how values play into this. Uh, this may seem like a very abstract topic, but I assure you it will uh, go down to very, very basic Things and I will give you recommendations for some daily activities to help you uh, develop all of these. Now, let's see first what we hope to achieve with step two, right? So there are a few goals. In step one, you have made progress. You have identified uh, what triggers your picking or pulling. You have identified your emotional responses, your thought processes. Um, you have hopefully reduced your picking and pulling by implementing appropriate techniques. But that was a behavioral intervention, right? Um, for these to work, I believe I said this 752 times in the previous webinar, all of them have to become habits. A replacement habit has to be a habit, as the word suggests. So when we say a competing response, it sounds almost like a pill, but what it actually is, is, is supposed is a new habit. One way to establish, uh, the only way, let me correct myself, to establish a habit is through intentional repetition. 
This is why step two is so important because it helps you stabilize the progress that you've made and to make additional progress. You can have the greatest competing responses in the world. Uh, if you do not get into the habit of using them, they're practically worthless. And the only way to get into the habit of using them into, is to be disciplined and intentional about it. Uh, patience comes into play uh, in those moments when you stagnate. And this always happens. Progress is kind of topsy-turvy because humans are such messy beings. And there will be periods when maybe you don't get worse, but you don't get better either. And then you're kind of reach this plateau and you don't seem to be able to move forward to reduce your peaking even more. This is where patience inevitably comes into play, uh, both as a force that pushes you to do better and also as a skill that prevents a relapse, right? So we need all the skills we're going to talk about in step two so that you both keep the progress and continue to progress. Uh, and then, of course, it's preparation for deeper work, which we will undergo in steps three and four. Uh, you can you don't have to think of steps one and two as being completely separate. You can think of them as being kind of intertwined, especially towards the end. The end of step one ought to overlap with step two to get the most out of it. All right. So these are the, in short, this is what we hope to achieve with what we're going to discuss in this in this webinar. Okay, let's start with discipline and let's start with um, with the definition of the term because usually I like to clear up what I'm talking about before uh, before I actually tell you what I think about it and how to develop it. So discipline uh, comes from the Latin word discipulus, which means a pupil or a student, you know, disciple. It's kind of obvious. And that means, as I said, a student. So a student is someone who always learns. That immediately tells you something about the very nature of discipline, which is that this is not something that we ever attain and then have forever. This is something that we test and reacquire every day. Kind of like when you do meditation and then you get distracted and then you refocus. Uh, to me, the core of meditation is really in refocusing. And the same way here, the core of discipline is in failing and trying again. So that is how you build discipline. Discipline is not something harsh. Like if you're thinking about a nun that is going to, I don't know, yell at you or just be very scary in front of you um, because you've done something wrong. No, that's not what I mean by discipline. I also don't mean harsh parenting. Discipline, in fact, is not a strict judgy thing at all. And you will see why. In general, I started with Latin because that's the, the origin of Obviously, the word has its origin in Latin, but also because uh, throughout this um, throughout this webinar, we will be referencing very old sources, mostly Roman. So uh, it's the it's kind of the nature of the of the topic. Here's a quote from Samuel Beckett that I really really like: um, "Ever tried, ever failed, no matter." Try again, fail again, fail better. And I think this kind of encapsulates the very core of discipline, which is that you give it your best shot. You don't necessarily always live up to what you expected. You fail. It hurts. But then you get up, you try again, you succeed for a while, then you fail again, then you get up again, and then it's rinse and repeat. Right. Um, so this is this is the core of discipline. It may sound uh, very simple, and it certainly is very simple, but it does take um, it does it does take uh, courage, I think, uh, to face the possibility of failure again. And we will go into details on what kinds of disciplines are there and how to cultivate each and what you can do practically. But if you 
want like a, a digest of what discipline is i think this does a good job of conveying it also i'm looking at this photograph of him and i read somewhere i'm not sure if this is true or just anecdotal uh, just an anecdote that someone made up um but when he won the nobel prize you know they they uh, they give you a phone call whenever when when you win and his wife answered the phone and they said, well, this is the Nobel Committee. Um, we have some very good news for your husband. And she said, well, you have to tell me what it is uh, so that I know if I should let him on the phone. And they said, well, he won the Nobel Prize for literature. And she said, oh, no, how horrible. He's going to be so upset about this. So Beckett was a really special kind of a person. Here's another one. Um, I'm kind of conflicted about his philosophy, leaning towards not liking it, but let's not let a good quote go in vain. He says, for a man to conquer himself is the first and noblest of all victories. I think this, this is, like, once again, like a nice summary of what discipline and patience will do, except that I would take issue with the word conquer. Um, I don't like using war metaphors uh, because I find that when you go to war against a part of yourself, uh, that part of yourself um, tends to get a little upset and not very cooperative. And you can't exactly, um, you know, get a knife and cut a part of yourself out. So I find that discipline actually works much better when it's coupled with a more compassionate approach. I will say a few more words about this uh, in the end, but you can think of it maybe not as conquering yourself, uh, but maybe as um, as transcending parts of yourself or further evolving yourself. And then there is this Abe's quote, which is a wonderful and, and clear definition, which is discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. And this is a point that I will make towards the end, which is that discipline is not about is not only about not picking in the moment when you feel the urge to do so. It's not about using your competing response either. It's about who and what you want to become in the long run. Like what's at stake? Why is it that you're making the change? Uh, well, as I said, we'll talk about this later, but... If you just remember this quote and the first one, this one by Samuel Beckett, I think the whole uh, the whole part about discipline is is kind of condensed in these two. So uh, discipline is really a way of directing yourself, right? Of self creation. It's a gentle force. Now I should have put gentle in bold letters here. Uh, because it's really, really important. So it it's not guided by desire. It, discipline is not an impulse. Discipline is a conscious decision. It's you saying, I want to mold myself in this particular way. I want to shape myself so that I become something at the end of my journey. In order for you to have discipline, you need to have a clarity of vision in terms of what you want to become. And gentleness here, or rather a compassionate force, uh, is very important because it is a process, not something you just attain and then move on. So a process always involves meandering and it always involves failing or flailing. Um, so you have to be very compassionate to yourself. We also know from research, so there are actual studies that show this, that if you want to change or learn something new, uh, a much better way to do that is to give yourself validation when you do well, rather than to scold yourself when you make a mistake. Our brains are, un fortunately or unfortunately, not that different from brains of other animals when it comes to learning. For example, uh, I know because uh, I have a dog and then whenever I, wherever I live and wherever I go, I always have to find a dog park so that my dog can... Uh, pretend to be a dog at least for a while because I don't think she deeply believes that she is a dog uh, but then I talk to a lot of dog owners and they will tell you how exasperated they get and how they yell at their dogs and sometimes even hit their dogs 
I can't imagine hitting my dog. Honestly, I could rather imagine cutting my hand off. And and my dog is really well behaved. And then people assume that I've taken some extraordinary measures to teach her all these things and to train her. But that's really not true. Uh, what I did was provided a structure and a clear strategy for reinforcement. Uh, I used to, When my dog does something well, I give her a treat or I pet her or I play with her. I validate her good behavior and she catches on very quickly. When she does something wrong, I don't yell at her, even though at times I will say I was very tempted because, well, we've been, she's 13 years old now, almost, uh, and we've been through some very challenging times, but I always have to be patient enough to resist my impulse to yell when I feel helpless because I know that force doesn't work, right? It doesn't, to yell at her, it really doesn't help because all she gets is I did something bad and she might feel bad, but she's not likely to do something different next time because I didn't give her any, any useful, fruitful direction. So when I say sit and she sits and I give her uh, a treat, uh, luckily she's very easy to please with food as long as it's not poisonous, she will get deep pleasure from it. So I give her a treat and then she knows, okay, so this word means sit. Not because she suddenly understands language, but because she suddenly understands that if I give her a treat every time she sits, when I say sit, she she does something well. So through validation like this, she was able to learn a lot. And I don't just mean tricks. I mean how to be a well-behaved dog, you know, where to do her physiological things and where not to, and how to ask for stuff. So a lot can be accomplished if you if you're if you validate yourself for your successes and try not to be too hard on yourself for your failures. If you're listening to the, or watching this webinar, rather, um, you know how difficult and challenging it is to change. You know how much work it takes and how frustrating and exasperating it can get. So whenever you're about to get upset with yourself, think about this. Think that you're just adding more fuel to the fire by being bad to yourself. So... Even with all the neuroscience, which is really great when it validates our assumptions, a general principle is, is that we have to challenge ourselves, but not overwhelm ourselves. There is no reason to add more suffering on top of what is already a difficult situation. So think of it as a, as a process through which you become the kind of person you want to be, and you do so in a compassionate, gentle way. Instant gratification is the opposite of discipline. It is also the opposite of patience. It is quite literally the opposite of everything we will be talking about today. The good news is, however, that discipline is something that you can cultivate. It is a skill, and every skill can be learned. So don't think of it as something very alien. Right. So when I when whenever I teach mindfulness and tell people that when I first started meditating, I simply decided that I was going to meditate. Um, people always and then I just did it every day since. Uh, people always look at me like I'm insane, but for me it was about clarity. Like I knew that the experience that I had sitting the first time, the second time, and every other time. I clearly saw how it could benefit me, how it could enrich my life, how it could make me see things in a different way. And then I made a conscious decision to do it every day. It doesn't mean that I that I feel, you know, like I'm in the mood to do it every day. It just means that I know what I want to become and where I'm going and why is it that I'm using this tool. So I choose consciously to do it every day. Right? So it's not about easy it's not about wanting, it's not about feeling gratified, it's about the long game, about who you want to become. Uh, this is, I, I'm talking about discipline and not willpower for a reason, and the reason is that I see very limited value in willpower. 
first of all, willpower is always short acting. You can have willpower one day or two days, but you cannot force yourself to use your competing responses every day. It simply does not work that way. Um, what you see here on the left, uh, I was when I was Googling images, uh, there are actually two tarot cards in this presentation, but I just thought the representations were really wonderful. So here, uh, this is uh, a deck from what I could read that was published in mid 17th century. So one of the oldest tarot decks that were ever made, which I guess explains the, the kind of grotesque nature of the quote unquote artwork. But the image that it displays really is, um, displays the best and the worst about willpower. Uh, you see a woman prying open the mouth of this, I don't know what this is, a lion or um, I don't know, some kind of a bear, wolf, whatever, this indeterminate animal. And with enough willpower and strength, she can perhaps pry open the animal's mouth. But how long do you think the mouth will stay open? Five minutes? Six minutes? Before she runs out of both strength and willpower. And what's going to happen then? What's going to happen, let me tell you, is that the animal is going to turn around and bite her. And so that's exactly the problem with willpower. It's a short-acting resource. It's not sustainable. So it will it might help you one day, but it's not going to help you over the months and the years that change requires us the time that it takes right it's convenient on those difficult days when you need an extra push but that's about it it's a blunt tool it has nothing to do with shaping yourself with becoming a certain type of a person it's in no way grounded in your values you know so it's not something that you should rely on if you intend to make your change sustainable Whereas discipline is gentle, it's compassionate, it's a long game, it's a process. So this is why discipline is more valuable than willpower. Although it doesn't mean that willpower doesn't have some uses. There are days when you might need a little push. Just keep in mind that that little push can only be done once every so often. It cannot be something that you base your change on. This is not just a um, just an abstract di distinction that I'm making. It's also about it also tells you how to choose the tools that you will use. You can't just copy something that other people say. You can't just um, you can't just say, "Oh, this worked for X. Sounds cool. Therefore, I will adopt the tool myself." Every technique that you use has to be appropriate for you. It doesn't mean that it's going to feel natural and easy because nothing feels natural and easy at first. Natural just means that we've been doing it for so long that it feels like a part of us, right? Initially, nothing does. But this is why in step one, you have to be very intentional about choosing your competing responses so that willpower is not something you have to do daily, but just something that you resort to on those days when you need that little extra push. Uh, the reason why I said that a lot of our webinar will be Greco-Roman is because the best writings on discipline that I can that I could possibly find comes from uh, from Stoic philosophers, and my own relationship to Stoicism is a very very complicated one. I intensely dislike most of the contemporary Stoicism because I think they they take what is a philosophical system and then boil it down to self-help techniques you know like nine tips that Seneca can give you to become rich tomorrow it really bothers me because I think it's it's reductionist in the extreme and I also think it doesn't do justice to stoicism and I also kind of feel like all these philosophers are being disrespected uh, when they're rather complex ideas are being kind of turned into merchandise, if you will, into a commodity. Stoicism is meant to be a way of life. Stoics have deeply influenced uh, not just ancient philosophy and not just modern philosophers, but also a lot of Christian philosophy and a lot of Islamic philosophy. And they have had 
their tentacles extend into many, many directions. They've given original contributions to logic, to our understanding of how the mind works, to our relationship to emotions, and so on. So I really don't like to, um, I don't like this modern approach. And then also I have some qualms with the philosophy of Stoicism itself. Namely, um, this is not perhaps entirely relevant for our webinar, but please bear with me. It might be something that you want to think about. So Stoics, um, in addition to having a lot of practical and useful techniques that help us deal with our emotions and help us live a better life, uh, they were also quite deterministic. Their entire metaphysics was deterministic. The, the whole point of, of Stoic philosophy is to live in accordance with nature. And nature essentially determines a lot of who you are and what you can do and how much you can achieve. Uh, personally, I was always more on the side of, per, of agency, of personal agency, because as a therapist, I'm more interested in what we can achieve uh, than I am in how we're limited. But dealing with body-focused repetitive behaviors has some similarities, and perhaps there is merit in considering this deterministic worldview to a certain extent. Whereas we don't have to adhere to same behaviors. So picking is not anyone's destiny, and neither is pulling. Uh, but feeling the urge perhaps is not something that you can always control. And regardless of what the ultimate truth of things is, in the moment when you feel the urge, you feel the urge. And there might be nothing that you can do to make it go away. So in that sense, uh, it, this idea that certain things are just, you know, certain cards are dealt to us might be useful for people because we have to uh, we have to accept our present moment experience and then ask ourselves, what is it here that we can change? What is it here that we can do? So I, whereas I'm not deterministic in my thinking by any means, in fact, this is, this is, as I said, this is a really big issue that I have with Stoicism. And this is why my favorite Stoic, the a philosopher that I truly admire, Marcus Aurelius, he gives us quite a bit of agency. And he makes a good, he makes a, he makes an effort to direct us into where we have agency, uh, which for, for skin picking and hair pulling means, think about it this way. Uh, there are things that you can do which is you can choose to do a competing response instead of picking. You can choose not to look in the mirror. Uh, you can choose um, not to respond to the first impulse and feeling that you get when you take a look at your skin. But you cannot choose what your skin will be like. With all the good skin care out there or all the good hair care out there, uh, what your skin looks like aesthetically is still not entirely under your control, even if you have loads of money and are able to afford ridiculously expensive treatments. Our biology is very complex, and not only have we scientifically not figured it out, some things, even when we do figure out, we simply cannot control. So this is something that's worth taking into account, and we'll consider it practically in just a few moments. So let me read this quote by, by Epictetus, one of the great Stoic philosophers. Um, he was also, it's very interesting, he was particularly concerned with questions of freedom, and he himself was a slave who became a teacher at some point, because slavery in ancient Rome wasn't necessarily a, necessarily a lifelong thing. You can, this, you can be born free, but end up a slave, or be born a slave and end up free. It was a, it was a very complicated world back then. But he was he was a slave and began as a slave and then ended up being a very esteemed teacher and one of the greatest philosophers of all of antiquity, I would say. So he says the following. Uh, there are three things in which a man, a person in our case today, ought to exercise himself who would be wise and good. Also, just a, a brief thing. I didn't change, like, instead of man, it should be person. Instead of he himself, it should be they themselves but themselves but i i didn't change the quotes because this is from the original translation and it was also written a while ago um the first concerns 
the desires and the aversions, that a man may not fail to get what he desires, and that he may not fail into that which he does not desire, not fall, sorry, into that which he does not desire. So the first thing where we need to develop ourselves is to understand our desires and our aversions. Aversions are also desires in Stoicism, weirdly, but it's a desire for something not to be. So an aversion to, to let's say, suffering is your desire to not suffer, essentially. It's just a, a bit of a language game there. But the first thing that you have to learn how to deal with is the desires that you feel, so that you don't fall into that which is not good for you, and that you choose what is good for you. Like the second concerns the movements um, and toward and the movements from an object, and generally in doing what a man ought to do, that he may act according to order, to reason, and not carelessly. So this, what this actually means is that the second concern is how we act in relation to other people, right? So when it comes to his first concern, it should be fairly obvious how that relates to BFRBs, right? It's about the urge to pull or to pick. And what is it that, what, what's the wholesome thing to do there in that situation, right? The second desire is how you relate to other people and to society as a whole. This is another qualm. Sorry, I'm ranting, but it is what it is. Another issue that I have with um, modern Stoicism is that it's hyper-individualistic. It's all about you being the master of yourself, about you achieving certain things, about you becoming wiser. Whereas the original Stoics, and I think all of them, all of them that I can think of right now anyway, have emphasized not the exact opposite, which is that you should get over yourself to a large extent and be focused on the community in which you live. So they're very much directed about how to do right to others and how to assure that we are a respected part of the community to which we belong. In fact, Stoics believe that we're all so deeply interconnected that overall we're all one. In his meditations, because this is, I, I have to say, I will refer to, to Marcus Aurelius the most, because he's simply the philosopher of the Stoics, at least that I know the best, because I've read meditations uh, over and over again. It's a, it's a book that I really, really like. But in that book, he says in one place um, that he belongs as a citizen to Rome, because he's the emperor of Rome. But as a human being, his community is the world, all the people that live in it. So we have to know how to react to our own desires. And then we have to know how to, act, how to act in relation to other people. And then the third thing concerns freedom from deception and rashness in judgment. And generally, it concerns the ascents. So this is a more, uh, this is a more, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for words how to describe it. So this is about, so if the first one is about knowing how to rea react to your desires, this is about freeing yourselves from them. This is in, incidentally going to be our step three in, so the next webinar, when we, when we move on to step three, that's what we will be talking about. Like, uh, in in step one, you learned uh, how to react to the urge by introducing an appropriate competing response so that you don't necessarily fall into what you do not desire. Uh, and then in the third step, we will learn how to, uh, quote unquote, get freedom or free yourself from your reaction, from, from your emotional states and from your desires. This is not, I'm not talking about enlightenment in any kind of spiritual sense, although you're free to take it there if you want to. I'm merely talking about reframing the relationship that we have to our internal experiences. And this is also what Epictetus is talking about. But these three points translates into three facets of discipline. Uh, I will, so I, there are different ways to, uh, to name these. Uh, discipline of desire, discipline of action, and discipline of ascent. But I've decided to use these terms because they seem more accessible. And these are the terms that Gregory Hayes uses in the preface of his um, 
translation of, of meditations by, Mike, by Marcus Aurelius. He has a really brief explanation of all three of these. And so let's go over each of these and then see how they really react to trichotillomania and excoriation disorder. First, first, first one is discipline of perception. This means maintaining objectivity of thought or seeing things as they are. I put objectivity here in quotation marks um, because I don't necessarily think that we can ever be absolutely objective. For me, seeing things as they are really means seeing things as they appear to me right now. Because when I see things in a certain way, I don't care if that's the reality, absolute reality of the situation, because that is how they appear to me. And I cannot jump out of my own eyes and see things differently. I'm not talking, of course, about interpersonal relations, where a part of mature relationships is to see the world through each other's eyes. It's just that even if I see my own actions through someone else's eyes, it's still not objective because it's still through someone else's eyes, right? So we don't have this immediate access to reality. But when we talk about discipline of perception, we're talking about things as they appear to us. So seeing things as they are. I think it's fine to just summarize it that way, as they are for me or for you. Here's uh, here's an, here's a quote from Book 3, uh, Meditation 11, uh, from Marcus Aurelius, obviously. He says, One must always make a definition or description of the object which is presented in an impression, so as to see it in itself, as it is in its essence, in its nakedness, in its totality, and in all its details. One must say to oneself the name which is peculiar to it, as well as the names of the parts which compose it and into which it will be resolved. So what he's talking about here is not just seeing things as they appear to us, but reducing them down to the most basic, concrete description of things. It means that when you say, I feel the urge to pull my hair, that is you naming what is happening, but it is not... Uh, I, I see a typo here, sorry. Uh, but it is not you making a description of the object or description of the urge. The description of the urge is not just naming the urge, it's breaking it down into its components. Is it a thought that keeps coming back? Um, is it a feeling? Is it a pressure? Is it something that moves around? Is it restlessness in your fingers? Is it an itch? If so, what kind? So in order to develop discipline of perception, it's not enough to just know what we're feeling in this abstract way. We have to break it down, cut it into tiny, tiny, teeny little pieces. You will notice right away, we talk a lot about emotional avoidance as being a part of, of body-focused repetitive behaviors. And right here with the first facet of discipline, we see that our job is not just to react properly, but also to see clearly. So we have to look at all the unpleasantness of the urge and decompose it into its constituent parts. Here's another uh, example of how to do that in real life. This is from book six, uh, passage 13 of the meditations. Um, how important it is to represent to oneself when it comes to fancy dishes and other such foods. This is the corpse of a fish. This other thing is the corpse of a bird or a pig. Similarly, this Falnerian wine is just some grape juice. And this purple robe, which is the imperial robe, only emperors would wear purple togas. This purple robe is some sheep's wool dyed in the juices of shellfish. When it comes to sexual union, we must say... This is the rubbing together of abdomens accompanied by the spasmodic ejaculation of a sticky liquid. I have to say this is possibly the most unerotic and banal description of sex I have ever read. How important are these impressions which reach the thing itself and penetrate right through it so that one can see what it is in reality? So what is he saying here? Let me use this example of the of ejaculation. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, let's use the example of the purple robe, right? 
he talks about his status. The purple robe, the imperial toga, is something that distinguishes Marcus Aurelius from everyone else in the empire. So that is a is not just the clothing that he wears. It's also a symbol of his power. It's an emblem of power. When he's wearing it, at the time when he was wearing it, he was embodying the most powerful position in the world. Today, when we talk about US presidents, for example, we frequently say the most powerful man in the world, but Marcus Aurelius, keep that in mind, had a lot more power in his day. So in that sense, the power is enormous. And what he says, all that is nonsense, because this is just a purple robe in some sheep's wool dyed in juices of shellfish. What he's trying to say is that, yes, there is a lot of power that is tied, knitted into this toga, but really I am just like everyone else, right? Uh, my meal, which is so tasty, is a corpse of a fish. And he's not saying this to make himself averse to enjoying his meal or renouncing his powers as an emperor, which he has never done, in fact. Marcus Aurelius was an emperor in very, very turbulent times. Uh, most of his life was spent uh, fighting Germanic tribes um, and a few insurrectionists here and there. So he had his, his hands full most of the time. He was a very diligent, good emperor in that sense. Someone who truly embraced his responsibility. This, the same way I'm sure he enjoyed the corpse of a fish. But what he's saying is that there is a difference between what things are, how they present themselves to us, and then how we experience them. Because if you think of food as this sublime pleasure, then you might become gluttonous. But if you enjoy that, knowing it's a corpse of a fish, you just move on because it's nothing special. It's just dead animal. And the same way th that you can keep all this power from getting to your head. And if you know about Roman history, uh, some truly crazy people have worn that robe before and after him. Before him, Caligula, Nero at some point. Like they were not nice people. Uh, in general, there was a tendency, for, especially for these younger emperors like Nero or later on Elagabalus to, to go completely crazy because the, the, the burden of the power that they had to carry and the responsibilities that came with it was just too much. Marcus Aurelius was very fortunate in that respect uh, because he came to power when he was an adult and he was kind of prepared to be an emperor for a very, very long time. Uh, so there is a way he kind of, by looking at his purple robe as just dyed sheep's wool, he could stand next to any one of his soldiers and not think of himself as superior just because he holds more power. And so what does this mean for the urges, you must be wondering by now? And is this man just rambling on aimlessly about things that come to his mind randomly. I am not. When you apply this to the urge, then what, what is in one moment, I must pick this scab or I must pull this hair, becomes there is an irregularity of my, on my skin and my heartbeat is accelerating. Sometimes when you boil down these things to the very, very basic components, it immediately creates a kind of detachment from it. If you go to our blog session section, uh, there is a blog about rain for urges. And I advise, it's, it's a rather long blog, but it's a transcription of how I apply the rain technique with a client. She was kind enough to give me permission to transcribe the whole thing. So you can read it. And one of the things that we do in, in, by applying this technique is to, to really reduce down the experience to, to this level of concreteness, not to say banality, because that's where you kind of 
really see things at their most fundamental level. That pressure in your chest that you interpret as I must pick is really just pressure in your chest. It's maybe shallow breath, right? There is nothing about that sensation that implies the interpretation that you give it. Because imperial power is an interpretation of a purple robe. But purple robe in itself, as, as Marcus Aurelius points out here, is just a purple robe. So try doing that when you feel the urge to pull or the urge to pick. Try pausing, taking a deep breath, and explaining to yourself what's happening in the moment in the most banal, concrete terms. Sometimes it's sufficient to say, now I've seen an imperfection on my skin and I'm going to pick it. Or I'm going to pull this hair now. It's very simple. Try when, the, when you feel the need to do it, try just saying that out loud and then let it sink into you. Give yourself you know, 10, 20 seconds for those world, words to sink in and see what happens. Just describing the situation accurately sometimes gives you freedom from it. Uh, let me give you an example, uh, not of this practical thing, but how, um, but how this, um, how you can apply uh, clarity, rather, sorry, um, discipline of perception through clarity to a specific uh, situation. Um, so this is, I will give you several quotes from descriptions uh, from a client that, um, that I worked with. Uh, she came to me not for therapy, but for life coaching to learn mindfulness. And she also struggles, struggles with hair pulling. And so we kind of use mindfulness for her to deal with this as well. And so here you will notice how she's becoming more aware of what's happening. And as her awareness becomes more, uh, becomes sharper and clearer, see how she starts dealing with the situation differently. So this is, let's say, not the beginning of our work, but let's say a starting point. It usually starts with me touching my hair, just running my fingers through it like I'm somehow fixing it. Then I narrow it down to just a few hairs, then to one. Then I run my fingers up and down and eventually wrap it around my index finger and just pull really quickly. Then there's that second of pleasure pain. She describes that and uses one word, pleasure pain, that is just perfect. As always, guilt sets in right after. Sometimes my cheeks become visibly flushed. As I'm doing all this, I am, uh, as I'm doing all this, I am and I'm not aware. I know what I'm doing, but somehow I let it continue semi-consciously. So see, see the, how this description compared to the other ones that I will give you is a little bit vague. So she knows how it all starts, but then, you know, it's called pleasure pain, which I think is a really wonderful way of saying it, of describing it. And then she describes being both aware and not aware, and she wants it and doesn't want it. There's a lot of fuzziness here, right? She can describe the beginning of the process, but then things get a little murky. And let's see, after a while, after some time of practicing mindfulness and specifically trying to be aware of, of the process, she says the following, I can now catch myself running fingers through my hair and I'm aware that I do it when I'm staring at the screen for too long. So here's another component. So she catches herself early on, and then her field of awareness has slightly extended for her to know that it has to do with staring at the screen for too long. So it's not the screen, it's not her eyes, it's the length of time in which they interact. That's rather specific. And then she continues. I'm not quite sure uh, how that helps, and why I do that, other than to say it's a habit. I've been doing this for so long, of course it's a habit. But when I notice it, I'm able to stop. I just put my hands down on the keyboard, and then I continue with my work. So, 
what do we have here? Her field of, of awareness is slightly more extended. She's um, she's aware ex of exactly what's happening, and this gives her the ability to choose. She can either continue or stop. And then she chooses to put her hands down on the keyboard and then continue. But at the same time, I urge you to look at where her awareness ends here, right? So she realizes that it's when she's staring at the screen for too long. And then she says, I'm not quite sure how that helps, right? So what do I do with this? She doesn't know. We continue with our work and then comes the following. I notice that I start feeling some restlessness in my legs, like I want to move around. I know I will start fiddling with my hair, so I say to myself, you know where this is going and you are going to put your hands back on the keyboard because you want to stop pulling your hair. If you want to stop pulling your hair, then you need to not pull a hair now. When you don't pull your hair now, you are closer to becoming a person that treats herself with care and dignity even though I did not treat myself with a spell check here. Um, uh, this work, because uh, anyway, this works most of the time. Sometimes I need to do some breathing or stretch, but it feels good to say those words to myself. This is why you want to put your hands back to have this vision. So here she further extends her awareness. In the moment when she stares too long at a screen, she actually starts feeling restlessness. That's how she knows, uh, like she wants to move around. That feeling is an indication that she uh, has been staring at the screen for too long, right? And then she kind of extends her uh, spectrum of, of actions to help her deal with the situation, the situation. So she notices that she has been staring at the screen for too long because she feels this restlessness. But this restlessness kind of tells her that she needs to do some breathing or stretching. And notice how, as she becomes more aware, a picture is starting to assemble. There is a kind of clarity here now. She doesn't want to stop pulling for the sake of not pulling, but because she wants to be the kind of person that, care, that treats herself with care and dignity. So she has a vision, as she says. And then here's another one. I'm using my own version of the Pomodoro method. The first four hours of work, I take 15 minutes every hour. That means that every hour she takes a 15 minute break. I look out the window and take a few sips of tea. That's the, that's the break. The second half of my work day, I take breaks every 45 minutes and then stretch, breathe or, or call a friend or mom, my mom to hear from them. Sometimes I meditate too. I created a collage that I framed and put up. It says dignity and care. Apparently I'm not capable of spelling the word dignity. And that is very undignified. Uh, that reminder gives me strength. So here we see how she started with this vague idea that pulling begins when she starts running her fingers through her hair. And we ended up here. Where, where she has this crystal clear idea of the kind of person she wants to become. So she, in a way, in order as she was developing both awareness and discipline, she was also kind of creating an overarching uh, goal. So her journey is not to stop pulling her hair. That's a, a stop on her journey, which is to treat herself with dignity and care. That means that putting her hands down or getting up at this method that she developed um, of taking breaks in this specific way, um, to her, that is being dignified and taking care of herself. So she shifted her mindset from I want to stop pulling to I want to be a certain kind of a person. And then not pulling became a way to embody this. And then she developed this whole complex strategy around it that is what gives her discipline as you can see as she was going through the process and learning more about herself uh, she was kind of gaining more and more discipline as she was thinking more in terms of of values of who she wants to become so let me summarize this for now uh, 
hand movements and urges to pull here in this example are not judged as good or bad. They're not judged at all. Notice how she doesn't place any value judgment on her urges. She's not a failure for feeling them. She's not a bad person for, um, uh, for having them. Uh, she doesn't think of herself as being careless or a failure when she succumbs to the urge. There, there are no judgments like this whatsoever. And personally, I think this is what helped this client progress so well. Because she was focused on what can I do for myself now. It started with something as simple and not very uh, self-compassionate, which is put your hands back on that keyboard and keep on typing. And then it grew into, let me be a person that treats myself with kindness and dignity. And it was kind of, she was building towards that step by step. So there is an attitude of acceptance, which is the opposite of judging yourself. Uh, knowing what is and isn't in one's control. Notice how it, it not as, at a single point did she mention being frustrated with feeling the urge. Not at all. Instead, she was thinking in terms of actions. What can I do now that I'm feeling this? Right? And then when in the later stages, it was more, um, how can I prevent this from happening? But in the moment when it was happening, it was clear to her that what she was feeling is not in her control, but her response is. There's this indifference, which is how I would summarize all this. Not as in, I don't care, but more as in, I just don't judge myself for what's happening. Uh, she's also becoming more mindful of her body. And this is the key part of the, of the awareness. You could have noticed this, that she's observing things through sensations. She ended up having clear values and then intentions that sprung from these values. So let's go to the second facet of discipline, which is the discipline of action. Uh, we aim to act with virtues, Stoics would say, but we accept the outcome of our actions with detachment. So we don't get too invested in every little strategy that we try. One replacement technique or one type of meditation or one skin lotion, whatever it is, cannot be the measure of who you are and how much you're worth. And the reason why we do not invest ourselves so much, why we practice detachment, is because we don't control everything. So even if our intention is clear, the outcome may be something else. And the outcome may be that something else because there are many things that we cannot control. Uh, let me give you an example here. Uh, sometimes we have the best of intentions and we want to help someone. And what happens in the end is that this person gets, gets upset. I'm sure that um, you, if you've been struggling with body-focused repetitive behaviors, that you, for a long time, that you have this experience where people that genuinely care for you and love you will be the most frustrating people in the world. They will say, why can't you just stop? Or they will sometimes yell in frustration. They will ask you, how's therapy going every three days? Uh, you know, almost annulling the results of therapy with the frustration that they cause. All of this weirdly comes from genuine concern. It's just that they don't really have the ability the first time, but when we communicate well, then they the responsibility is on them to change. But the first time, or if we don't share how we feel, they have no idea that their actions are actually backfiring that what is meant to be helpful and what comes from the best of intentions is actually causing further frustration, which is why our responsibility has to be to, to communicate back and communicate clearly. Don't say this, or if you want to help, here's what you can do, right? So this has happened, I think, to most people. And this is a good example of how even when we act with utmost virtue, so with the purest intentions, it can backfire, right? So 
this is why we cannot be completely invested uh, in every technique that we try to use to change ourselves. We act in accordance with our values and we don't judge ourselves when the outcome is not what we anticipated. Uh, so far, I hope you could have uh, kind of um, understood how useless these judgments are. Uh, because we approach things ideally with detachment, then we think in terms of what didn't work and what worked and why. So we analyze the situation, we learn from the situation, and we strategize. Because we're not fully invested in the outcome of a particular experiment, we can learn. We have, let's say, quote unquote, objectivity. We have a little bit of distance, some breathing room between what we feel in the moment and how we act in the future. Stoics talked about virtues. I'm talking about values because it seems a little more down to earth in the, in the world in which we live. But they had four cardinal virtues. I will briefly mention them just in case you might find them inspiring, but you don't need to adhere to any one of these whatsoever. Um, my goal here is to get you to think about the values that guide your actions, not to take over someone else's. If they resonate with you, with you then you know by all means, adopt them. So they're wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. Uh, wisdom means knowing what's good and what's bad. And for Stoics, that's very simple. This is something that I think would maybe be useful for most of you, which is that things that are out of your control are neutral. If you can't affect it immediately, if you can't do something about it, it's neither good nor bad. It's kind of like a given. It's, it's neutral. They further complicate things in logically rather dubious ways by talking about preferred, uh, preferred indifferent things or neutral things and less preferred things. For example, a preferred uh, indifferent thing or a preferred neutral thing would be having wealth or fame. Um, fame is neither good nor bad, but it's better to have more money than not to have it. But ultimately, having or not having money is neither good nor bad because it doesn't always depend on you. What's good or bad is how you respond. So to translate this to the, to the BFRB situation, uh, when you feel the urge, that's neither good nor bad. It's neutral. It's indifferent. Your response to it can be good or bad. And I would not I would suggest not even using words such as good or bad. I would suggest using words as useful or not useful or functional or not functional. So that's wisdom. Knowing how to respond in the situation. Uh, courage means just kind of facing the unpleasant head on or rather not avoiding things. Uh, come to think of it, this one could also be helpful. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Then we have temperance, or the art of moderation. As uh, Marcus Aurelius, I think, I think it's him. I'll end up attributing every every stoic nugget in my that I have in my head to him in the end. But he says somewhere, um, if you want to do more, do less. Right? So things will... You'll do things with better quality, with better balance, more wisely if you temper yourself, if you slow down, if you find the pace that works for you. For example, if um, if you end up stressed or overworked and then too tired to have wisdom, to discern between what you can and cannot control, uh, temperance might be a virtue you want to take up and start cultivating, living by. And then there's justice. Um, justice for Stoics means mainly kind of acting in accordance with nature, doing what's right for the community. So it's not this individualistic um, notion of justice, like what I deserve. No, it's what's good for the community, what's right, what follows nature. This whole notion of what it means to follow nature, I will address it a little bit um, briefly, because it might give you a perspective that could be potentially useful. So, what falls under uh, under discipline of action? It's living in accordance with nature. It's considering our actions in social context. Uh, it means clearly defining out our social roles. Uh, so, what is the power that we hold? Uh, what is the power that other, others hold over us? 
Why is it that we allow them to have this power over us? Is this power institutional, structural? Is this power that we personally give them? Sometimes uh, people have power in what Stoics would call an objective way. Uh, let's say, I don't know, cop pulls a gun on you. I think the distribution of power is pretty clear in that situation. Um, on the other hand, there are some people that don't necessarily have power if we don't give them power. Um, that means, let's say, you crave everyone to like you. This is something that I hear every day working with people who struggle with body-focused repetitive behaviors, which is this need to be validated by other people. And then unknowingly, this desire to be validated gives them a lot of power. They basically get to shape you and mold you and, and create who you are, which may not at all be what suits you. So you have to take charge and be proactive and define how you want to play the roles that you're given to play. Some of the roles we can choose, some of the roles we cannot choose, right? Or rather, we don't want to not choose them. So they feel like they're mandatory for us. But we have to have clarity there as well. Because how you define yourself in relation to other people will tell you how you can act in relation to them. For us, for body-focused repetitive behaviors, because that's ultimately what we have to bring all this down to, is knowing where your boundaries are. Um, if you're overextended at work because you can't say no to things, or you want everyone to like you so you can't say no to things, this will lead to, to more pulling or more picking, ultimately. So learning how to say yes or no to things that you actually want to say yes to or no to is a, a fundamental thing on your journey. Like this is something that you cannot, you cannot do without, right? Also, uh, I have to say, um, uh, when, we, when we talk about discipline, uh, I, I think initially most people will think about like doing the same things every day, like using your competing responses regularly or I don't know, meditating every day or brushing your teeth every day. So this may seem like like we're veering off the topic, but we're not really because um, saying yes or saying no is care for your well-being. So in that sense, we're pretty much still on the same topic. Asking for help when you need help is also something that has to do with discipline of action. So it's how you relate to other people and how you relate to society as a whole. And the third one is discipline of will. I told you there would be another tarot card um, here. Um, it's too bad I cannot find, I couldn't find an image in, in, in a bigger resolution, but this appears to be a brilliantly executed drawing. Um, it was done by an author of his name I might mispronounce, Yasen Gusliev, I think, is I believe Bulgarian. I couldn't do a full-blown research on a on a card because as you can see, there's quite a bit of research that this webinar required as well. So anyway, this card depicts this elaborate and rather tacky tower built by humans. And then you have this gigantic godlike figure that just waved his hand and the top of the tower just disappeared. And this is what Discipline of Will talks about, which is how we relate to things that are not in our control. While we are in control of our own actions, so you are in control of, pick, of not peeling, picking or not pulling, or uh, picking or pulling, right? Uh, and you bear responsibility for stopping those, their responsibility not being the same as guilt. Uh, we encounter a number of events, like feelings in the moment, some thoughts, life circumstances that we don't control. And those we have to accept and make peace with. A concept that is known as amor fati, or love for your faith, or loving your faith. Here's a quote from Nietzsche. Not a stoic, but a good quote. So, My formula for what is great in mankind is amor fati. Not to wish for anything other than that which is. Whether behind, ahead, or for all eternity. Not just to put up with the inevitable, much less to hide it from oneself, for all idealism is lying to oneself in the face of the necessary, but to love it. 
So not just to put up with the inevitable, but to love it. This doesn't mean that we have to be in love with uh, the painful stuff that we experience, just that when we have no other choice to embrace it. Very, 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 very often, and even if you look at what you're writing in the prompts, um, there's a lot of talk about this feels unpleasant or I'm not comfortable with this or um, you know, I want to avoid discomfort or I want to avoid feeling bad or I want everyone to love me. Those are all variations on the same topic, which is there is a kind of suffering that I'm trying to avoid. And in the process of trying to avoid that suffering, I'm creating new suffering, different suffering, but suffering nonetheless. And if you just face the inevitable suffering head on, then the additional suffering you create becomes unnecessary and non-existent. So when we make peace with what we cannot control, then we can really see what is it that we can do. Just because you have thoughts, I have to pick this pimple, for example, or because, um, because whenever you see something on your skin, you have to react. Uh, it's a thought that you have to react. It's a feeling that you have to react. It's a thought or a feeling that is out of your control. You can't help but have it. But when you know that you have it, then you get to choose. You get to say, I will stick through this, this unpleasantness and anxiety, because feelings and thoughts eventually go away. Whenever you think they will not go away or they will keep coming back forever, just remember that this is you thinking this in order to facilitate avoidance. Nothing lasts forever. Thoughts always go away the same way that they came about. Thankfully, because the world is already in a bad shape. Imagine if thoughts wouldn't go away and we felt compelled to do everything they tell us. What a tragedy that would be. So here's a summary of this, uh, again, from Marcus Aurelius from Notebook 7, Meditation 54. Uh, this is a rather damaged statue of, uh, a part of a statue of Marcus Aurelius from the Palazzo Massimo Museum in Rome. I highly recommend this museum. It's almost empty even in the at the peak of the tourist season, and it is remarkable. It, I, I've never seen examples of Roman painting in that number. Like there are whole rooms of Roman painting, floor to ceiling um, in there. It's really remarkable. I took this picture, which is why it's of worse quality than the other ones. I liked it because this statue is damaged. Look at how his nose. Um, was destroyed. This used to happen a lot after the Edict of Milan and when Christianity was kind of ascending to become the official um, religion of the empire. A lot of the pagan statues were damaged, uh, especially their genital areas and noses. So that's why I took this picture. Um, yeah, anyway, there's a random digression. Anyway, I'll, I'll go back to the, to the text here. So here's what Marcus Aurelius said when he still had his nose. Everywhere, at each moment, you have the option to accept this event with humility, to treat this person as he should be treated, to approach this thought with care so that nothing irrational creeps in. As a constructivist, I obviously take an issue with, the, with irrational, but again, this is just evaluate your thoughts. Will they lead to useful actions or will they lead to useless actions? That is essentially what he's saying here. And to treat this person as he should be treated, this also means you in the situation when you're feeling the urge. So values and discipline. Um, you have to be clear about why you want to stop picking or pulling. Uh, to achieve that, you have to be clear about your values. So you have to take things to a, you have to level up, right? What kind of a person do I strive to become? Uh, values that you say are your values, but that you don't, if you don't live by them, if they actually don't influence your decision making, they're not actually your values. That's just a facade you're putting up to think of yourself as a good person or so that others would think of you in a certain way. But unless something is actively shaping the decisions that you make, 
then it's not a value. Maybe you want it to become your value in the most sincere way possible, but unless you actually use it to base your decisions on it, it is effectively not a value. So when you say, I want to stop picking for whatever reason, sit, think about it, and think if this value is actually your value, or do you first need to make it your value? Do you need to start behaving in accordance with it? Because that's what values are for. They're supposed to tell us what's right and what's wrong. And when we have our values set, and when we're, when we're clear about what they are, and there's no judgment there. Like sometimes I will, I will have clients, will have this discussion, and then they will say things like, well, I'm embarrassed that this is my value. Well, if you're embarrassed in front of me, that's kind of useless because I'm a therapist. My job is not to judge you. As a private person, I really don't judge people because their values are none of my business. Um, as a therapist, my job is to help you feel better. If if this is your value, if this is going to make you feel better, then there's nothing to be ashamed of. Acting in accordance with your value should be validation enough. Who cares what other people think, especially your therapist? So when you know what your values are, when you're really okay with them, then you can use the relevant value, whatever that may be, to enter into every situation with a clear intention. Because your values tell you what to do and what you need to achieve and what goals you should set, right? So your values tell you what to strive for. When your values mix up with the circumstances that you cannot control or predict, you get the outcome, right? But if you acted as your values tell you to or not is the only validation that should matter. This is what I was talking about when I was talking about giving power to other people. If you're not grounded in your own values, then other people always have power over you because their word determines if you did something good or something bad. But when you're absolutely clear about your values, then you know, then you're good. So knowing your values also helps you bring your locus of control inside. They help you be more stable, more clear, about where you are and where you're going and who you are. So you have to be really clear about why is it that you want to stop pulling your hair or picking your skin. And this is not as as easy as it seems because a value actually has to be a value. Without that, we get this kind of a fuzzy image. Um, This is actually a picture that I took a couple of days ago in the morning. This is... um, This is from my office uh, window. Uh, If you look very carefully, you can see like my terrace here and then buildings across the street. Um, But what this is, is just raindrops. Um, But that's what what, what the process looks like when you don't, when you don't have your values in order, right? It's very fuzzy. You can discern some shapes outside, but you don't actually know what they are. Right? So um, let's take a look at the, these examples here. I want to stop picking my skin because I want to remove uh, imper- because I don't want uh, because I want to remove imperfections from my skin. Oh, yeah, this is a this is a client who was talking about how um, uh, his initial impulse to stop picking was uh, to remove imperfections, but then he realized that um, that he's also creating imperfections because picking leaves scars. So he wants to stop picking because he doesn't want to have any more imperfections on his skin. But what hasn't changed here is this idea that his skin should be perfect, which is something that no one has ever had. And also not something that is in, that's in his control. Skin depends on many factors, our immediate environment, hormonal status, our health, who, you know, where we go, what we touch, and so on. So it's not something that we can control. But then when we discussed this, my client reframed it like this. I want to stop picking because I want to be self-compassionate. And then self-compassion became a value. And then we cultivated self-compassion in different ways, not just through abstaining from picking, but also in other ways. But when you when but there's a difference because if you stick to the surface level here quite literally, 
since we're talking about the skin. Um, it's not something that that is um, it's not something that is attainable. Whereas being a self-compassionate person is because treating yourself in a compassionate way always depends on you. Your actions depend on you. Whereas what happens to your skin depends on a gazillion other factors that you're not in control of. So when you switch this journey to the level of values and think of it through that prism, you go to internal validation versus external validation. So it's not about what your skin looks like. It's about whether you're compassionate to yourself or not. And then it gives meaning to your struggle because it's not just this fuzzy resistance to weird feelings. It is a clear path. It is you being on a journey to achieve something. Now let's talk about patience a little bit. Um, patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, problems or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. Just this tiny little thing, right? Uh, patience, in other words, means understanding that events unfold at their own pace and not how we want them to. When I was a younger therapist, um, I had, uh, which was just like two months ago, <clears throat> just kidding, unfortunately. But when I just started working as a therapist, like, um, well, 13 years ago now, um, said Vladimir quietly um anyway when I was when I first started working as a therapist I would have clients who would come to therapy and then they would say something like um well I came to resolve this problem let's just do it in two months and I knew back then that this is not possible and not because um not because I didn't know what I was doing but because you never know about these things it's like when you meet a person for the first time, how on earth do you know um, how long their healing will last? It's not like there's a recipe for our psyche. Sometimes I think because we live in a culture that favors instant gratification so much that you have the, these popular life hacks, which always induce vomiting in me uh, because our psyche has its pace. Therapy, coaching, whatever method of of healing you want to use will help you nudge that along a little bit and do it faster. But there's only so much. You cannot accelerate change at your own pace, at the pace that you want it to be. That's what I mean. It's just not possible. So healing is something that takes time. And patience means understanding that, but truly. It requires you to wait and not become annoyed, upset, or angry. It requires you to look at setbacks and think of them not as rolling down the hill, but as another step on your journey. Here's another obstacle that you have to overcome, right? Here's another situation where your GPS is not navigating properly. So it, obstacle, there's a I have to resort to Marcus Aurelius. I'm sorry. Lately, as I because I reread the meditations entirely to prepare for the webinar, and then got me into this whole process of reassessing Stoicism and what's useful and what isn't. Um, so those are the references that now spontaneously come to my mind. But Marcus Aurelius says that impediments to action actually generate more action, and that's exactly what patience is. It's so here is this problem that's in front of me. Uh, solving it will take time. So when you encounter an obstacle, your brain should go, huh, let's come up with some solutions for this. Not think in terms of this has to be resolved right now. Right? So that's that's the difference. Here's, I've been using these uh, all these uh, non-Christian sources. So let me give you a Christian source of impatience. This is actually uh, this was actually shared with me by a by a former client of mine, and I'm really grateful. It was helpful for helpful for her, and it's a, it's a really lovely poem on uh, talks about patience. But before we get to this, look at the picture on the left. This breathtaking photograph. This is um, the Grand Canyon, and this was actually created by water erosion. So a river did this. Imagine how many years 
thousands, if not millions of years. I'm not a geologist. I have no idea. But how many years it took to carve stone like this? That's patience for you. So if you need something to remember, uh, I gave you those two quotes that kind of encapsulate one by Lincoln and one by Beckett to encapsulate um, discipline. Remember this image and remember the fact that water created this over millions of years, and that's what patience is. So let me just quickly read you the, the poem. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. Uh, we are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet, it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability and that it may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't forget, uh, don't try to force them on as though you could be today what time, that is to say, grace and circumstances acting on your own goodwill will make of you tomorrow. Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. Now, you don't have to be religious to find value in this. You can substitute God with time, with nature, with whatever you want and believe in, right? Um, Stoics would definitely say nature. Uh, in fact, it's through these obstacles that our nature is being kind of revealed to us. So when we think about patience, we think about this. We think about something that happens very gradually and us being very present in the process, as opposed to wanting to jump ahead and skip steps. So I'm, I want to talk about impatience a little bit as well. Uh, and the reason why is because impatience actually has physical consequences, not just mental ones, ones that could lead to you being triggered further. So impatience leads to acute and chronic stress, right? And stress has its consequences on your physical health as well as your mental health. Patience reduces burnout and leads to overall fewer negative emotions. So as you cultivate patience, this kind of acceptance of the flow of things, you are actually reducing burnout and overall helping yourself have more, more positive emotions. Patience improves your focus and makes you more resilient. Mindfulness and gratitude help you cultivate patience. Uh, I will talk about that briefly in just a few seconds. And this is, uh, let everything be your teacher. This, these are very famous words by Pema Chodron, a Buddhist teacher. And I find this to be really beautiful. And I think this is um, this is what the poem is about. Um, and this is what Stoics think when they talk about nature. So we have several perspectives converging here, um, which is that think of obstacles as lessons, as something that will help you grow even further. Right? Think of obstacles uh, and as as a as a, as an opportunity for you to show your nature in its most creative, right? Um, impatience has roots in anxiety and frustration, and the and the inability to tolerate it, the, the anxiety and frustration, and the inability to delay gratification, right? So impatience is essentially awareness that your wishes are being ignored. Um, I'm going to give you two uh, slightly more, um, one or two, let me see. Yeah. So one is once again, uh, Mr. Aurelius. And the first one, this is um, a constructivist uh, perspective on things. Sometimes impatience feels like a matter of life and death. Um, like you're going to explode. Like you have this unbearable need to do something, a lot of energy in your body. And it feels like, like you must, absolutely must pick or must pull and you cannot wait anymore, right? In constructivism, we see this sometimes as something that we call dependency constructs. 
These are constructs that are on low levels of cognitive awareness, meaning they're not entirely conscious. Uh, let me translate this. They're kind of baby constructs. Those ways, those patterns of seeing the world and reacting to the world that we had when we were very, very little. Because a baby will cry very loudly for big things and small things alike. Because for a baby, this distinction between what's important and what isn't is not a relevant distinction. A baby will cry and everything will seem like it's the end of the world, right? And it will not be, and it will not, the ba a baby will not understand why things are happening or what, what it means. It'll just feel something uncomfortable, something difficult, something unpleasant, and then it'll start to cry. When we get wrapped up in our needs or dependency constructs, we tend to end up with black and white thinking, right? It's either or, I either get what I want or things are going to be very, very bad. And they have this sense of urgency. So the, I mentioned now uh, in passing, the dependency constructs are actually what we think of, um, what we think of as needs. Right. So, for example, when you're hungry for a long time, you might feel this. And the urge refers to this as well. Except that when you interpret this need that you have as I must pick now, this is only one of many interpretations. This is one of the beautiful things about constructivism is that it tells us to be very, very skeptical of how we, what meaning we assign to events uh, and to our feelings. Uh, I would, I would, at this point, since I've been talking forever already, I would refer you to the webinar I did on self-soothing. You can find it in, in the BFRB club and I elaborate a little more on this there. And here is what Marcus Aurelius says, um, which really all boils down to, um, to just kind of looking for lessons in distressful situations. This uh, is a statue uh, of Marcus Aurelius uh, it stands today at Piazza del Campidoglio in Rome. So if you ever go to Rome, check it out. It's a beautiful square designed by Michelangelo, I believe. Anyways, in Notebook 5, he says, just as you overhear people say that uh, the doctor prescribed such and such for him, like riding or cold baths or walking barefoot, as you can see, Roman medicine was quite special, say this, nature prescribed illness for him, or blindness, or the loss of a limb, or whatever. There, prescribed means something like ordered so as to further his recovery. And so too here. What happens to each of us is ordered. It furthers our destiny. This is the deterministic aspect of stoicism that I talked about, and it bugs me. But the fact is that when you feel the urge to pull or to pick, it is not something that you have consciously chosen to feel. And likely, unless you pick or pull, you cannot make it go away either. So it's something that you have to accept. And then Marcus Aurelius says, if you have to accept this ugly feeling, then ask yourself, what's the lesson for me here? How can I be a better person if I overcome this feeling? Like, what's in it for me? Look for meaning in what's, in what's happening. Now we're going to go over how to cultivate uh, accountability. Uh, sorry, how I was reading the title, how to cultivate discipline and patience. So the image on the right is my version of meditations. As you can see, it's already beaten up. It's a really good translation. Uh, I have several because I'm an uber nerd, uh, but this is my favorite translation. It's by Gregory Hayes. This translation has several editions, um, but so different covers also. Um, but this is the most kind of uh, most down to earth translation. Uh, so first of all is accountability. You have to be accountable to yourself. And sometimes it helps to be accountable in front of other people. One thing you can use our prompts in the BFRB club, because we um, every other week, we have prompts that directly relate to the practical side of things. So what's working, what's not working. What have you been doing? Where do you feel resistance? You know, what are you doing well? And we have those prompts that get you to explore your uh, your picking or your pulling from a more psychological side of things. So we balance it out. One week this, one week that. This will give you a sense of accountability. 
And it will also give you that sense of community that Stoics say is so important for discipline because of, of accountability that communities give. That's one way. You can attend support groups when we start ours or any others that you want to. Um, you can find an accountability partner, someone to work things through with. For example, I, I follow, um, I respond uh, to each comment in the VIP section, but I also um, I also read through most of the stuff that people write in the in the public part. And I see that they do this. They act as each other's accountability partners. They follow up on things, ask how something went, how something works. Um, it's That's quite helpful. And then obviously journaling is a way to keep yourself accountable. I will tell you a little more about what kind of journaling helps because not every, not all, all journaling is, is equally good. Uh, journaling can help you understand your strengths and analyze obstacles you face. So if you do it properly, it can give you a clear image of where you need to go next and where to develop. It's a good way to track your progress and understand your resistance to change. So here are three ways in which you can journal. So you can just randomly sit there and write whatever comes to your mind, but you can create these daily little prompts for yourself. Um, so I know that some of you use the, the, the prompts that come out every Friday and then that you journal extensively in your own journals. That's fine, but that's not, I mean, by all means do that, but that's not what I mean here. Here I mean accountability journaling. So daily check-ins, good, better advice would be one way to approach it. One sentence on what you did well to be disciplined today. So how did you use the tools that you have well? What is it that you can do better tomorrow? And look at the, this is essentially asking you about what you didn't do well today, but there is no need to self-flagellate because that doesn't help. Turn your errors into what you can do better tomorrow and then give yourself an advice. Assess your entire day and come up with one short sentence that will summarize it. Encourage yourself, essentially. Those are three sentences. This shouldn't take more than five minutes to do. So what you did well, what you can do better tomorrow, and give yourself uh, an advice, a little bit of encouragement. You can have a specifically BFRB journal. So... Write down your triggers, your thoughts and feelings, and then again, give yourself advice. Like very simple. This is not even three sentences. This could only be several words. And then you can do a third person check-in, which is very useful if you're having a hard time being compassionate to yourself. Um, so you write about triggering situation, you write about a triggering situation in third person. So uh, like Kathy was triggered by so-and-so. You give yourself a supportive message and advice as if you would you were writing for someone else. So Kathy, next time, maybe try this. And this is quite useful because writing down in writing things down in third person gives you a little bit again of a distance, and distance creates space, space in which you can think and consciously decide. And also if you struggle to be compassionate to yourself. Uh, you're usually able to be compassionate to a friend. So treating yourself as if you would treat a friend is usually a very good way to start being compassionate towards yourself. Another important thing is to set clear intentions, intentions, which means choosing consciously the direction you want to take. Uh, you can do that for the day, at the start of each day, or you can be situational about it. So if you pick in the bathroom, before you enter the bathroom, you set your intention. My intention is to wash my face in 30 seconds and leave, right? Or my intention is to go and take a shower and leave without looking in the mirror or um, however you want to phrase it. But in, an intention has to be very specific and it has to be coupled with awareness of what is and is not in your control. Because if you walk in, if you're set the intention not to feel the urge to pull, for example, that is like setting an intention to fly. You don't know, you, you can't do that. There's, you cannot fly and you cannot decide not to feel something. But you can set the intention to be focused on, I don't know, um, whatever it is that you need to do when you go to the bathroom. I don't think I need to list the activities, but I hope you see my point here. So 
be specific and be acutely aware, as acutely as you can, of what is and is not in your control. That is crucial for developing discipline and also confidence. The, the reason why intentions are so important, it's not because they have this magical new agey thing. It's mainly because intentions shift our focus. They tell us what's important. So they help us of all the stimuli that we receive when we enter into a situation, our intentions will tell us what is worthy of our, of our attention and what isn't. And then gratitude. Um, so this is just a sense of thankfulness and appreciation for the current moment. It's not meant to be a form of toxic positivity. Like it's not meant to erase what's bad. Struggling with skin picking sucks. Struggling with hair pulling, horrible, awful experience. Well, I can say it since this is not a public video, so it's not censored. Feels like shit. Like this is not a good experience to have. So when I talk about gratitude, I'm not saying ignore the bad and just focus on the whatever, something good. No. What I mean is something akin to what Marcus Aurelius said. Right now, I have a choice to do the right thing, which is to use my replacement habit instead of pulling my hair, for example. If you do that, you should be grateful because you were strong and resilient and you made the right choice. Especially if it's difficult, you should be all the more grateful. It's not that you should ignore how difficult it is. Not at all. In fact, you the, the point of gratitude is to balance your perception, to see the good and the bad, that you're sometimes building character because you're experiencing adversity. In Buddhist meditations, for example, when you cultivate gratitude, you sometimes focus on the bad things, on the difficult relationships, on um, on all on on what was hard for you, what challenged you. Uh, I use this image on the left. This is a picture that I took. Um, this is obviously the Colosseum in Rome. Uh, I took it. I think the last time or the time before that, when I was in Rome, I was um, with my sister and it was raining every single day. I use this picture because it, it did illustrate a moment of gratitude and also um, also it's kind of in theme because I've been mentioning a lot of Greek, and a lot of Roman philosophers. But anyway, we were... Um, for example, at one point we we were stuck in this church for half an hour because it was raining so much and the wind ruined my umbrella at some point and damaged hers and it was really just a mess. Here you can see an edge of my umbrella on top. And then when we arrived in front of the Colosseum that I've seen like a gazillion times, I was wet and tired and exhausted and really just annoyed. And there are a lot of tourists here, like in, in this area around the Colosseum and the Forum, whatever part of the year it is, it's always swarming with tourists and people trying to sell you crap. And everything was annoying me. Yet when I looked up, once again, for like the millionth time, the Colosseum just took my breath away. And I was grateful to be there and to see it. Because I was standing in front of 2000 year old piece of brilliant architecture. It was, it's sublime and it's really beautiful. And I was still wet and still tired and still annoyed. And I was kind of even able to appreciate it more because I always, I always think, ah, the Colosseum, I've seen it a million times. There are so many more exciting things in Rome. And every time I go there and stand in front of it, I'm in awe at how beautiful it is. So to me, that was I was grateful for that moment, even though overall it was a really sucky moment. You can see the picture almost looks blurry with how much rain there was, and this was a better part of that day. But it's just so breathtakingly beautiful. So I was annoyed and grateful at the same time. You're not meant to ignore the bad experiences, but cultivating gratitude will allow you to also see what you can do. It's very easy for negative content to kind of overflow our entire awareness and to overwhelm us. So gratitude helps us balance this. You can do this as an informal mindfulness exercise, just going about your day and then pausing after certain events or 
a few times a day and just thinking about what happened and these tiny little things that you could be grateful for. Sometimes it can be like just nice morning coffee or meeting someone you like in the hole, like any one of these little things. Or you can keep a gratitude journal. It doesn't have to be anything big, just one sentence on what you're grateful for. Gratitude, again, like most of these practices are a long game, but it'll help you stay disciplined because it will provide that little bit of um, that little bit of validation that I was talking about earlier that's so important. And then there's practice, practice, and practice. Um, you see, I could not amend this. Uh, I could not help but amend this image in this subtle and technologically advanced way. Practice makes good enough. It does not make perfect. Nothing ever makes perfect. So here's a, in the vein of our overarching topic, which is Roman philosophers and emperors. Repetitio mater studiorum est, or repetition is the mother of learning. And that is true. Repetition with a clear intention is what will create discipline and what will create new habits and what will ultimately help you conquer your BFRB. Uh, but don't think of conquering again in terms of wars and battles. Don't think about it as even stopping picking or pulling. Think about the kind of person you will become by achieving these goals. So repetition plus intention and intention is coupled with values. So intention contains what you're supposed to become when you don't pick or pull. So goals have to be in service of our values and therefore about our sense of self in order to be worth pursuing. So practice, but practice what's meaningful and in the way in which it is meaningful for you. So finally, we arrive at the end. Uh, this was much longer than I expected. I hope uh, you're not all asleep. Um, Yep. So if you're in the VIP lounge, you can use the ask away link and submit any questions and I will get back to you. I have now created a schedule for these things from Monday to Thursday. I will answer your questions in 24 hours um, since I've decided not to work on Fridays so that I remain sane and at your service for longer periods of time. Uh, thank you for your attention and um, and See you in the next webinar.